transform, transform fear into, into curiosity. curiosity. Whenever, Whenever we, we see a see risk, risk, we, we see, see the, the flip, flip side, side of it as an opportunity. opportunity. What, what often causes, causes fear is a lack, a lack of knowledge. knowledge. So, the, so best the best thing you can do is begin to educate yourself. COVID kind of accelerated a decade's worth of digital transformation down to a few months. Larger, big tech organizations, uh, I know, uh, I know, you know, they, they have, have a lot of money, money to throw at R and D and things like, like that, that. But I think they can, they can also lose sight of, of some, some of these really, really important, important things, things on a on a very fundamentally human uh, uh, scale. scale. Thank you for joining Transform the Impossible podcast, which is the first of its kind future tech podcast from India. And today, I'm super delighted to have not one but two guests, Mr. Mark Palachi who is a Senior Foresight Associate at the Future Today Institute, a specialization in culture, art, technology, storytelling, communication, and strategic management. I have Brian Pogan, who is the Foresight Associate at the Future Today Institute, who has worked with clients from traditional publishing to large-scale internet platforms to leading edge programs in decentralization and space future. So just for starters, maybe, you know, would you guys like to kind of give a, a, a a brief introduction about yourself and what Future Today Institute is. Absolutely, Eddie, and, and thank you for having us today on the podcast. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to join you. So the Future Today Institute um, was founded a bit over 15 years ago um, by Ryan and my colleague, uh, Amy Webb, futurist Amy Webb. And we are a data-driven, technology-led uh, strategic foresight and futures organization. That means we function uh, similarly to a management consultancy, uh, but rather than the traditional management consultancies, we look at a 10 to 15 year plus time horizon, uh, and we have a focus on uh, emerging technologies and trends. Uh, and we help uh, every everyone from Fortune 500s to government agencies uh, to nonprofits uh, uh, mitigate the risk uh, and the uncertainty of the future, um, and ideally transform uh, risks and threats into opportunities. To piggyback off of Mark, we are looking, you know, again, at various futures. We know the future uh, isn't just, just one event, but it could be uh, possible different events. So again, just working with clients to stretch their thinking, uh, to look beyond that linear future and to make decisions in the present accordingly that can help them uh, achieve um, that desired future. Right. So how easy or difficult is to stretch their thinking, you know, because when we're talking about emerging technology, we are moving slowly from a linear time, uh, timeline of the growth of technology to an exponential space. Now, when you say a 10 to 15 year time horizon, obviously, you know, that's like a very difficult proposition for a client. How, how open are they? Well, I have to say that, uh, especially since COVID has started, we have had, um, if anything, increased interest uh, in both strategic foresight in general and obviously in, in more clients coming to, to us uh, because they're feeling the impacts of a lack of preparedness, right? They, they were hit with a, a real curveball, um, what some would consider a, a black swan, uh, you know, highly rare event. So right now, I would actually say that we're at a point where um, executives might be more open than, than ever uh, to look out into a, a farther future than they would have before. But the other thing that we do uh, to help, obviously, bring bring them along, and there are going to be the skeptics and those folks who simply can't envision what uh, you know the the, the world uh, might look like a decade from now. We always ground our work in the present, um, and as I mentioned, we're we're data driven, so we're looking at signals, um, you know, throughout many different uh, sectors of society and and industries. We look for those signals at the fringe. Um, we corroborate those signals, uh, we score them, we make sure that we're not making uh, decisions based on hunches or, or gut feeling or instinct, but rather, uh, but rather on knowledge, um, verifiable and corroborated knowledge. By rooting those strategic futures in the present, we're able to, uh, as Ryan mentioned, create a set of strategic futures for the organization, the clients or, or, or the organization that we're working with. So we as an organization uh, will not claim to make predictions about the future. We try to make connections about the present uh, and then hypothesize about what the, the probable uh, features of, of, the, of the future are. Um, and then we look for the most favorable positioning for a, a client, an individual, a, a company within that highly probable future. 
Uh, and that is the way that we help those uh, those entities mitigate that risk and prepare today. With, with the pandemic, you know, obviously everyone was caught completely unprepared, you know, be it your nations, be it organizations, you know. We talk about digital transformation, but I, I think as, as society as a whole, we are completely averse to change. This word, you know, that digital transformation, is it just a word full of jargon which people conveniently use it at these big conferences and when the conferences are over they go back to sleep or, or they actually understand that the future is coming faster than our imagination and we need to leverage it. what what are the changes that you see in post post the pandemic you're absolutely right for some folks digital transformation is a is a buzzword something that they want to make sure is on the front page of their website so that everybody knows they're they're with it they're a contemporary um, and they're uh, you know somewhat technologically savvy what we try to do uh, is help those companies put their put their money where their mouth is essentially Sometimes these investments can appear risky uh, for the individual or, or the, the organization, the decision makers within the organization. Uh, but what we try to do is um, try, try to build a strategic future that shows them which of those strategies and which of those new decisions and, and new incremental bets that they can take are going to be uh, you know, the highest probability of paying off uh, in, in the future, given all of the different forces of disruption at play. Right. So, so do you guys service only local companies or are you looking at also companies from India and could you both, maybe you could start from Ryan and give use cases or what you guys have implemented as added real world value. COVID kind of accelerated a decade's worth of digital transformation down to a few months. Uh, so again, kind of um, hearkening back to what Mark was saying, a lot of these uh, digital transformations were available. Um, and so hopefully with COVID, that does serve as an inflection point that organizations are going to need to be more mindful of these changes. I, I think I might defer to Mark using some of these use cases, but I will say that no, it, um, it is a, it, an international scope of, of clients. And I think that especially opened up with COVID um, again, the affordances of meeting digitally and having digital tools uh, expanded who we were able to um, collaborate with and work with. Uh, and I think, again, that galvanized uh, feeling that organizations had kind of led new new clients uh, to our door. Ryan's absolutely right. We, we have a, a, a global uh, set of clients. We often work with multinationals. So we may be, uh, you know, certainly during during the uh, pandemic times, we may be hosting a video call with individuals from three different time zones, but all on the same team or under the same umbrella. Um, I, I can't speak too much about specific projects, uh, and, and unfortunately, but, um, but I will say that uh, India is 100% uh, on our radar. Too often there is a bias towards America and American technologies. Um, but as we we know uh, there are uh, tons of innovations happening everywhere from, from India to China to, to many um, you know, locations abroad. And we want to keep not only uh, the news from those uh, various locales, but also the insights um, and the voices from those locales present in our work. So we even host as, a, as an organization, we, we host, a, um, we, we invite a number of folks from our network. So that might be past clients, that might be past students. Um, we teach a class with Amy uh, at the NYU Stern School of Business on uh, emerging technology and strategic foresight. So it might be past students, past clients, um, and other subject area experts of ours that, that join on a, a, a roughly on a weekly basis to discuss the latest signals, the latest trends that they're seeing um, in, their, in their various environments. So we absolutely uh, ascribe to a, a global approach in that perspective. Right, right. And, and Ryan was mentioning, you know, how the COVID has completely impacted us, the world. I think for the first time, we are uh, have realized that we're sailing on this one, you know, small boat and we need to take care of each other. And, and 
and the opportunities have opened up in ways because you know technology has got this huge lens suddenly and people have understood that how if you leverage technology you could build a preferred future and even companies are kind of understanding that and i guess if there is more opportunity now for the ones who are resilient and have foresight you know so and all of these technologies are kind of converging so i believe that there is fantastic opportunity you know for individuals as well as businesses to kind of build a preferred future you have recently also released your report the future today institute report would you like to talk a little bit about that and how it's going to impact businesses and consumers not just in america but globally and also here in india so yes we're very thrilled about uh, the latest iteration of our report which just launched uh, last month um, at a a digital version of south by southwest with a with a keynote talk from our colleague amy the report this year uh, has over 500 trends in it. Um, it, it. It also includes a number of our frameworks from our methodology. So this is a methodology that uh, Amy established over a decade ago and that uh, you know she and we have been developing since. And one of the best things about uh, this methodology is that we keep it open source. So we have those resources right there in the report uh, for any individual who's interested in strategic foresight, who's interested in uh, you know, preparing for the uncertainties and risks of the future, um, they can apply those tools. We give instructions and, uh, and make it easy for those, uh, those individuals and organizations to, to apply our tools, uh, even without necess uh, us necessarily having to, to be there. Um, so the report includes those factors, the tools, the frameworks, and the methodology, uh, and then it, of course, uh, includes a very robust set of trends across this. This year, we've decided to split the book into 12 subject areas. Um, so you've actually got a number of volumes for, uh, for the full report, and you can pull one that dives deep on AI uh, and applies the, you know, I, AI is a, is a unique topic because it is not even a technology in and of itself, we consider it a new era of computing. So there's uh, there's much to be learned uh, within that space and uh, a really diverse set of use cases and applications for AI that we spell out. We um, cover a number of industries and also include uh, create more creative scenarios for potential futures and, and how uh, a future shaped by AI might actually look to a citizen of the world in, uh, say, 10 years or, or beyond. So it's, it's a nice variety in the report of, uh, you know, the, the, the hard data and the information. You can learn about companies that are working on these technologies. You can learn about unique use cases of these technologies, but you can also uh, hear about, uh, you know, sort of visions uh, of the future uh, and, and what the, the, the story of our everyday lives might actually look like as it is affected by these various uh, areas of disruption. Right. That's also, so, yes, I, I think that open source is going to be the future. I think there's, we need to break away from the silos and share information because you know the world is completely transformed only and only because of internet you know which is democratized knowledge you know there are like india is a huge place you know 1.3 billion people just maybe like uh, 10 years back uh, there were the economy was quite bad then suddenly this company a telecom company geo came and it gave out internet access to everyone at dirt cheap cost you know and smartphones like really dirty what that did was completely democratized knowledge you know there are people sitting in the rural parts of india who, are, who have access to internet and are creating businesses. And, and that's the world I think we should aspire or aim to get in where we collaborate, uh, share information, because I think the technology, all of the technologies, I, I don't know whether I'm using the right term, but it could potentially go out of human hand if it's not done in a collaborative way. Most of these technologies are so transformational that it could be, it could be disruptive as well as transformational and that's the space that that we are living in it would love to know you know your views on what ar and vr is going to do to businesses and uh, consumers of course so um one of the biggest uh shifts that we are expecting to see play out this decade is the shift from 
hands-on to heads-up technology. So the closest uh, or the, the most specific example, uh, especially with regard to extended reality, is the shift from a smartphone, which is essentially a supercomputer that is handheld with a screen interface, uh, to smart eyewear. Uh, which will resemble, uh, you know, the the, the eyeglasses that uh, that you and Ryan are wearing right now. But what we're looking at for this coming decade is for smart eyewear that is much more sort of casually wearable um, to be implemented and to become popular, uh, you know, uh, uh, amongst the general public, which will give way to um, a a whole range of augmented reality uh, implementations uh, in our everyday lives. So if we're walking around with a a set of eyewear on our face that we can both talk to and listen to, um, and also potentially have uh, added visual elements to our environment, it opens up a whole new uh, way of life. Uh, First of all, it allows us to be aware of our surroundings. And, uh, you know, as as I said, from hands on to heads up, that this is heads up technology, you can be, um, you know, sort of looking forward as you walk down the the street, but also be experiencing these these digital elements. One of the subcategories of uh, extended reality and, and specifically augmented reality that we're very interested in, and that is a new addition to the report this year, is diminished reality. But with diminished reality, we're actually looking to take the environment around us and mute or suppress certain elements. And that's audio or visual. The average consumer uh, already uses diminished reality uh, in their um, noise canceling headphones, for example. That's probably the most popular uh, diminished reality device that's out there on the market today. Uh, But as this technology becomes more advanced, uh, you might be able to uh, blur out or obscure or even remove or mask certain visual elements uh, from from your everyday life. So maybe there's a building in the skyline you don't want to see or a construction site that you'd rather, uh, you know, not not set eyes upon on your morning walk, something like that. There's also life-changing use cases for uh, individuals with unique sensibilities or sensitivities rather. So let's say someone who uh, lives uh, on the autism spectrum, there may be triggering sounds or sights uh, that cause them great discomfort, uh, displeasure, and, and uh, keep them from, uh, you know, uh, functioning in, in, a, uh, in an efficient way, diminished reality has already been tested in, in uh, you know, certain experimental cases and shown a lot of promise in, in improving the quality of life for um, those living on the autism spectrum. Another use case would be uh, for post-traumatic stress victims uh, who, again, have unique sensitivities to certain sights and sound sounds um, and diminished reality, especially as it becomes more advanced, will be able to detect and identify those sights and sounds and um, really provide that buffer for the individual, for the user uh, and, and improve their quality of life. So we like the, the optimistic applications of, of that particular uh, you know, subsection of the field. And we're looking forward to seeing the, the creativity that comes out when we have a whole new playing field beyond the screen now where we're playing with the entirety of our, of our field of vision with, uh, with this new emerging smart eyewear technology. I know they're finding more evidence that no, uh, noise pollution can have, um, uh, it can impact your heart health and your cardiac health. Um, so taking this idea of, of diminished reality, are we able to create spaces, especially, uh, I know Amy talked, about um, diminished reality windows in New York City. Uh, Could those block out all this noise pollution and provide a completely different environment that people are used to? Well, tying that to how that can affect your your heart health, maybe there's a way that diminished reality can actually, um, uh, yeah, make you a healthier person, uh, prolong your life um, and, and impact you in a positive way such as that. That Ryan's a futurist, so his brain goes to, all right, we're looking at diminished reality, but how does that actually potentially uh, affect healthcare? And might you have one company that is maybe producing the noise canceling windows and you get a, uh, a discount on your health insurance if you install them because you're at less of a risk for uh, you know, heart problems in the future. And these interesting connections, when I talk about futurists and FTI, not making predictions, but making connections, those are exactly the types of, of, of connections that we're talking about.
Uh, how cool is that? I guess I, I think in another few years, you know, when Apple comes into the fray, uh, Facebook is obviously uh, testing their uh, their AR glasses, and there's so right. many like you know, you know, magically Microsoft, Samsung, everybody in the game. And I guess in another few years, definitely or or mobile, which is kind of losing its utility, and and, and or laptop will converge in, in, in a device like this. And you said diminished reality. How cool is that? Where it mutes and suppresses thing rather than kind of adds a layer. And AR, VR, when it kind of matures, it, it's going to capture every thing, you know, I mean, because everything is going to sensorize, get sensorized. And whatever we look at, it, it, it's going to be captured. Now, what companies do with that data uh, is, is is a big question i think there's there's a information overload which is going on and maybe diminished reality could feed you the information that works for you and helps you now yuval noah harari is one of those foremost uh, philosopher who's talking about how technology is a double-edged sword and the pandemic has thrusted us into a surveillance world what what does that mean for businesses and consumers? Uh, with um, all these devices, um, organizations are going to be scoring us. They already probably are scoring us. Um, and that will take place with these um, these spaces of new realities such as digital headsets um, as we're, having more devices for entertainment, um, a network of devices that, that we use and are connected to each other. I, I think the really, um, uh, the area that does cause the most concern, but also again, a lot of opportunity is that healthcare space. Uh, we can have so much diagnostic information uh, about our bodies that can be transmitted to, to a doctor. Um, we can know in real time things that will uh, adversely affect us. But with that does come the complication of uh, a, a, new, a, new, a new threat level, a new surface level of information. Uh, and I think that is where things get the most um, complicated, as I said. We've, we've also seen during the pandemic that um, organizations and even schools have used surveillance on either uh, their employees or children at schools. Uh, again, uh, that's to promote efficiency or to try to prevent cheating. Uh, but again, that's getting into areas that, that maybe are in violation to individuals. Um, and I do think that is an important conversation that we have as we see more and more devices that collect more and more information. And again, algorithms working in the background to, to assess that information and try to make sense of it. The world today is so unequally divided. There is 90% uh, of the wealth is being held by 1% of the global elite. Do you think technology will play a role in creating an equitable future? Maybe Ma Ma uh, Mark, you can uh, have a go with that. Maybe Ryan can join me. You just brought up the topic of surveillance, right? And we are shedding, every individual is shedding data uh, at, at, at every second of every day. And there are more and more companies and more and more devices that are capturing that data in real time and amassing it, collecting it, processing it, um, and then potentially sort of nudging us in certain directions based, based on that data. Now, if we think about a future in which um, that technology could optimistically uh, lead to a little bit more of a, a, a balance and an equilibrium in terms of, let's say, wealth distribution, we might ask the question, is there a, uh, an economy that can emerge around personal data in which the uh, individual who is shedding that data or generating that data actually has ownership uh, over it and can exchange it uh, with, with the companies that, that value it and that use it and that need it uh, to, to grow and to develop their uh, you know, machine learning systems, et cetera, um, and, and therefore receive some sort of payment for it uh, in exchange. Because right now, the model that we see so often is a free product is, is offered to the user. 
but they're not paying with uh, with money. They're paying with data. Um, uh, so perhaps there is an economy that could um, uh, emerge in which the user has a bit more power and a bit more say and autonomy um, with regard to their private data, because it is valuable to these big, big companies. Um, and it's not that big of a stretch of the imagination to potentially put a put a price on it then. And Ryan, you want to join in? You want to say something about it? I know within the foresight community, um, there is this importance on decolonizing the future. Uh, to to create these visions of the future uh, so that others and other marginalized groups can benefit. Um, so I just I just see that practice in contrast to maybe some of these you know big business initiatives. Uh, and hopefully you know the onus is on us to remember that um, and to to use that in these visions of the future that we create. Um, and that we can continue to give a voice to those um, who uh, are not necessarily in, in positions of power and authority. Very important topic within the topic of tech and inequality uh, is bias in AI. Um, and so many of the data sets that are being used to train uh, current AIs are data sets that may be faulty or uh, not an accurate representation of the demographics that they claim to represent um, or that we assume they represent because the systems that we've used to collect data in the past have had biases ingrained in them. Um, addressing uh, bias in AI and, and, and bias in, in many of the structural systems of, of our society uh, is going to be critical as we hand over more and more uh, power and decision making to these algorithms. Mark, you were mentioning about you know, the, the report, the future report, and how uh, this decade, AI is going to create massive impact and humongous economical opportunity for businesses. So would you like to take possibly like Mark, you could take AI and maybe uh, Ryan can take another technology and kind of brief us or, or, or the listeners on how this decade is going to be impacted by artificial intelligence or the technology that uh, uh, Ryan would want to talk about? I think that um, what we are expecting to see this decade uh, with regard to AI is that it shifts the focus even further uh, towards data, data in every single uh, interaction and transaction um, will be captured. And so when I purchase, uh, you know, a, a cup of coffee at a local cafe, potentially, uh, you know, at some point in this decade, there will be technologies, not just capturing how I'm paying, who I am, how much, uh, you know, it cost me at that point, what my, uh, you know, salary level is, what neighborhood I live in, whether I'm buying that coffee in my own neighborhood, or am, am I in somewhere, am I uh, in a new location for that day? And if so, why am I there? We may have biometric scanners uh, saying, well, what's, what's this customer's heart rate when he buys this coffee? What's his uh, mental state, his emotional state? Uh, is, he, is he sweating? Is he cold? Is he hot? Um, the, the emotive, uh, the technologies to capture emotive states are also advancing very quickly. And together, the concert of that data about me will give, uh, you know, who, whichever company is collecting uh, the majority of this data, a very, very rich portrait of who I am as an individual. Um, and if they're able to capture that degree of data for every individual or for as many individuals as possible, they really get a map of the human experience and uh, what stimuli cause certain reactions in, in humans. And then the, the logical next step for many businesses is, well, how can we then manipulate <laughs> those behaviors uh, for, for our benefit? Now, oftentimes there is a uh, at least a proposed shared benefit. So yes, we may nudge you in this direction, but we're nudging you towards what we think you want to see, what you want to buy, what you want to hear, the experience of, of, of life that, uh, that aligns with your particular profile. Where it gets a little bit dicey is these, dis these algorithms are going to be making more and more decisions for us, but are they making these decisions with our 
uh, well-being in mind, with our best interests in mind, is the biggest question. One of the simplest implementations of, um, or more basic implementations of AI currently is as a recommendation engine. So, okay, I like these three songs. Well, would you like to listen to this fourth? Uh, because everybody else who liked these three songs like this fourth one. But when you take that to uh, YouTube, for example, who's most likely to watch the following video based on the last videos they watch, that can slowly, uh, or, or not slowly, that can quickly lead to um, a, a sort of rabbit hole in terms of the content that we're consuming, and it can uh, bias us towards more inflammatory or controversial or sensationalized content. And so even though that's something that our brain's saying, yes, I do want to click that, I do want to watch that, I do want to take in that content, it is um, potentially sort of hacking our brain a little bit. Data will be at the center of everything we do. It will only become more important. Um, and the granularity of that data and the resolution of the profiles, personal profiles built on that data um, are going to become much and much, much more rich over the course of the next decade. So any company that is not uh, exploring how AI could disrupt their business or how adopting AI solutions could uh, help bring their business into the future um, is risking quite a bit. I think that there is not a single industry or company out there that shouldn't be exploring AI in depth because it is a very vast and complex uh, area, but one that is inevitably going to um, find its way into every single industry on the planet, guaranteed. Right. So, so you're saying the next 10 years is going to bring in opportunities which businesses could leverage, but it also could lead to a world where more and more data is being offloaded onto humans. That means more and more decisions, human decisions, are, are being offloaded to machines. At this point in time, obviously, we have uh, seen the positives of uh, what data can do. You know? But what could be the negatives or the cons of a world post maybe 10, 15 years where all our decisions are being offloaded onto a machine? Uh, I think with automation uh, and autonomous systems, you know, we, all, we, do, we do talk about uh, the possibility of it taking jobs um, from individuals. Um, and I think, I think that is problematic, uh, but I think it does also open us up. I think it can... Um, prevent humans from having to work uh, jobs or have vocations that are risky or that are where their, their health is threatened by, you know, just the nature of the job. Um, so I actually kind of see an existential dilemma, you know, especially in the United States, we, um, we find value in our job and vocation and, where does that leave a class of people um, finding value? And again, that existential dilemma uh, that they could they could be in when autonomous uh, uh, autonomy kind of takes that away. But if we can reframe it, I think it does provide an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to find value in other things. That kind of brings in a whole uh, host of other questions of of how people. Uh, receive money and wealth and you know things like that but um, no I think I think we can always kind of reframe these in ways that that kind of do look at those opportunities and threats so even when there are threats uh, to the way that we've done things um, I think it's important to also think the positive aspects as well automation I mean you know, it, it's just kind of creeping up and kind of uh, the pandemic has kind of uh, uh, pushed us to social distance. Social distance will create industries to go for further automation that will lead to further job losses. So we are in that little circle of, you know, how do we get that out? But, you know, the current workspace, you know, because of the pandemic, everything is completely changed, you know, and Microsoft has taken this, this standing of giving their entire, almost like a 40% of their workforce a work from home option 
forever. Now that is completely drastic. Google, Facebook took the other, uh, the, they, they said almost till July, you, you can work from home and then you've got to uh, come back to office. Microsoft taking a decision like that, how do you think that is going to impact the future of work? And what does the future of work look like from your perspective or vantage point? Be able to collaborate in person is, is something, it's certainly something we at FTI miss. We would typically be, uh, you know, visiting clients in person in their offices and being able to work in their space. Um, there is there that immediacy that we just cannot replace in the short term with uh, any of our current digital solutions. Now, as uh, XR and, and AR get more developed, more sophisticated, as we mentioned earlier, perhaps there will be um, a little bit more uh, personality, a little bit more intimacy to the, the digital and teleconferencing space. But for the time being, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it pales in comparison to to in person so there's as, there's that aspect of things where while while there have been some very big claims made by companies in terms of how much the, of their workforce might be working from off-site uh, we may find that the the reality is a little bit less extreme right yeah, we, we, we are social creatures you know, and the physically mm-hmm. connected something which which drives us and we, we need that right uh, and and yes I have been invested in AR, VR, MR, and I believe that maybe possibly in another few decades, you know, maybe avatars and maybe haptic feedback will be able to kind of maybe replicate the uh, or physical experience. But I think that's still far away. Now, I am yeah. super excited about AR, VR, MR. Now, I'm sure you guys individually, both Mark, you and Ryan, have a technology of or a couple of technologies which you think are going to create the greatest transformation in mankind. So, Mark, would you start and address that and then maybe Ryan can join in? Sure. And, and what it is for me is a, sort of an extension of that XR, AR, VR, MR space, but um, it's this aspect of spatial computing. Right, so that the interface is actually the entire environment around us. And we're not having to push buttons, we're not having to swipe on a screen, um, but because our every movement, movement uh, and, our, and our every gesture can be captured with pretty, pretty good precision um, in, this, in this potential future, but I do feel that, that it's where we're headed, um, we're going to essentially be able to treat the entire world as an, a digital interface. And it also, I think, will lend itself um, very well to more creative industries and creative pursuits uh, because it simply uh, it, it, it broadens the playing field of what can be created and what can be experienced uh, in a digital realm. So spatial computing, I think, is one of the most fascinating um, and thought-provoking spaces for, you know, certainly for, for your listeners and for us at FTI to be exploring over these coming years. Ryan, would you would you like to add what is your technology which you believe in is going to create the, the deepest and the greatest impact in mankind? I don't know how to frame this as a single technology. I think that's what's interesting, you know, with this work. Um, we have our report um, divided categorically, but many of these domains overlap. And we talked a lot earlier about health. Uh, that's going to be impacted, of course with the this network of wearable devices, um, these diagnostics that are constantly being sent to a physician or to an algorithmic physician uh, to give us a more comprehensive view of our health. We're finding different ways to tackle these grand challenges that we're going to be facing. And even within this pandemic, um, you know, the use of messenger RNA vaccines. So we're tra- training the body to create proteins to stave off some of these, uh, some of these um, ailments uh, and conditions. And we're already seeing it now being applied to fight malaria. Uh, there's news out this week that um, there is a vaccine uh, in phase one uh, trials for HIV. Uh, so again, that's uh, an early indicator of what synthetic biology can bring about. So again, uh, this area where we use engineering, design, and computer science in relation to biology. So first of all, we can use that on the human body. We can fundamentally condition the body to fight off uh, these ailments rather than having to take medication. But also 
it can be applied to um, crops uh, and things like that. So we can engineer crops to uh, increase their nutritional value to last longer. Um, and I think those are going to be very important things as we do kind of uh, face, again, kind of these grand challenges, especially with climate change. Um, are there ways we can fundamentally, uh, on a cell level, affect the human body uh, to be better equipped to face uh, those changes in the climate? Are we also able to do that to our food supply um, to uh, help uh, create uh, substance for an ever-growing population? So I think, again, uh, more broadly, um, there are great opportunities within health, uh, more specifically um, on this biological level. Uh, there are uh, going to be just pretty large impacts as we move forward in the next 10 years. Right. Yeah, I think the really? genetic... Go ahead. Mark, please. Yeah, you're, you're saying something. Sorry. No, I was only going to say... Um, you know, Ryan rightly references uh, sin bio, synthetic biology, and if Amy were here, that would be her answer for sure. She's writing. She's writing a book on the topic at the moment, and and it's uh, it's it's really sort of a, a a subject on which she's quite passionate and 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 knowledgeable. But Ryan also illustrates another great point, which is that you start with one technology, maybe you anchor yourself with one technology, and you soon see all of its different tendrils reaching out into different areas um, of, of society, different domains, different realms. Uh, we have a framework in the, in the report and that we use with clients regularly called the 11 macro sources of disruption. And it, it tries to silo these, um, these various areas from wealth distribution to uh, government, to geopolitics, uh, to public health. And it, 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 we display those various sources of disruption on a wheel because you really, what whatever topic it is that you're exploring, whatever your question is, whatever your the industry that your company belongs to, it is critical that you look at all of these other areas and not ask, will that area affect me? But ask, how will that area affect me? And so when we look at uh, synthetic biology, for example, and, and new, new uh, wearables and biometric technologies, potentially leading to more longevity in life and fewer people dying from uh, preventable disease. Um, we talk about SynBio making crops potentially more nutritious and being able to feed more of the, 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 the world. It makes me think you asked earlier about uh, sort of use cases and applications potentially in, in India are around the potential for climate migration um, and enormous uh, sectors of the population, enormous demographics are going to uh, see in the next 10 to 20 years, environmental changes that make their uh, their the, the, their homes, their their territories, their countries, their regions unlivable. You know, potentially the temperature simply rises. Go. Well, you know, where do they shift to next? Um, we talk about geoengineering in the report as well, which is the attempt to um, create change, especially with regard to the environment on a planetary scale. So some of these approaches in geoengineering sound really um, imaginative or, or far-fetched, but, uh, you know, approaches as diverse as painting an entire mountainside white to reflect uh, the sunlight and potentially lower the, the temperature by, a, you know, a, a fraction of a degree. Um, or, or, or other incredibly large scale sort of planetary initiatives to, uh, to hopefully help mitigate some of that uh, environmental change. So you start with one technology, you start in one area and you quickly branch out into all of these others. That's kind of the, the, the wonder of futurism and strategic foresight, but also the challenge. I think we're just scratching the surface, you know, I mean, and there is so much grand problems that we can address. And yes, we're moving from science fiction to science fact. You know, we, we're going into a world which could, you know, take the notion of scarcity away and enter the world of abundance. For that, obviously, we have to break away or silos the way we function and throw away our veils, you know, I mean, and get into the brave new world and adopt and adapt these new technologies because I think it can create huge, huge transformation. What would be your pitch 
to the in listeners over here in india the entrepreneurs of business as an fti you know what india might look like a, a, like a trends for india in, for this decade mm. so what i would say in terms of the you know what we hope to do for our clients for your listeners um really for everybody that we come into contact with and that we share the the principles and methodology of 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 strategic foresight with is to transform fear into curiosity the the future is the future can be terrifying there is so much uncertainty it's never felt like uh it's never before felt like there is so much uncertainty um even in what might happen tomorrow much less next year and 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 in the next decade and but whenever we see a risk we see the flip side of it as an opportunity um and the very first step with uh any potential you know what what often causes fear is a lack of knowledge right a lack of familiarity we're scared of what we do not recognize and we're scared of what we do not know so the best thing you can do is begin to educate yourself so take an active role in educating you you've heard so many people say okay uh you know autonomous robotics are coming for our jobs well why don't we read about what the companies that are creating these robots are doing what their intentions are doing what jobs they may come for first ways that in the meantime maybe uh, autonomous robotics and human uh, workers can work in a hybrid model um and if so uh you know how how should i as an individual or a company be reimagining my workforce so that i'm not abandoning uh the folks that have given me so much you know their 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 time their labor their efforts their 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 insights for for so long but actually helping them transition into into a new future so my my absolute core piece of advice is always uh educate yourself um take an active role in learning about the future and it will become it will naturally become a little bit less frightening <laughs> and hopefully we can find some you know some hope some silver lining some some light at the end of the tunnel um in these potential futures because the future is always is is never unified it's always a set of potential futures and we want to find the most uh sort of plausible preferable future that we can aim towards and start making decisions today that will get us to that future well, i was also thinking you know um again kind of how this conversation has hopes here at the end on some of these grand challenges um i think larger big tech organizations uh i know you know they have a lot of money to throw at r&d and things like that but i think they can also lose sight um of of some of these uh really important things on a on a very fundamentally human uh scale uh and i think you know for individuals entrepreneurs and uh people you know kind of exploring this space in india um yeah just encouraged to keep looking at that human level um i think there are opportunities to innovate uh when you're you know on a smaller scale and and more scrappy and in ways that these big tech companies aren't quite able to do uh so again um just encourage anyone encourage listeners to to keep again as mark said that that exploration that curiosity um there's definitely impact that it will be necessary uh for us you know as a civilization as as we move forward and navigate uh some of these impending changes that are on the horizon thank you thank you mark thank you ryan it's a pleasure and honor to talk to you uh, and getting to know your insights you know and ryan you mentioned that somehow technology uh, the big tech needs to you know lo- not lose sight you know it needs to kind of build technology which is human first you know because i think if you are connected in ways where we create an ecosystem that reaches out and helps uh, everyone i think maybe this is philosophical but i think it can create a better future and mark you mentioned that education is the most important thing and if you can 
create fear into curiosity that would be super awesome what a profound note to end on and to my listeners if you understand that i think you know we are living in a world which has got so much opportunity and all of these technologies you know be it ai iot blockchain ar vr mr these these are tools which you understand if you can leverage it and not get scared of it you'll be able to build a preferred future and thank you uh, ryan thank you mark for being part of the show and to my listeners if you like what you see in here please press the subscribe button until next time see you guys bye bye thank you thank you